And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's not yet absolutely the time to start, but the things are up. And uh, I think I have to wait a moment till I get the okay that this is online as well. And oh yeah, I can see the slides there. Uh, I don't have the the thingy, but uh, you, if you switch it, it, well, it's not too many slides, so good. So here we are, thanks. Okay, so the Tetris project, I'm not going to introduce that uh, neither, uh, because you can just look it up online uh, <laughs> under this, <laughs> because I hate these EU project introductions, uh, especially if I have only 10 minutes to speak. Uh, the important thing is one of the aims is this linking local taxon lists uh, to taxonomic aggregators, uh, which is with the content of this improving access to etc. So uh, that's the aim of one of the tasks in one of the work packages. Tetris is much bigger, and so uh, if you want to know more about Tetris, uh, look it up online. <clears throat> So local taxon lists are a very wide uh, term that might go from a uh, researchers in any biological field uh, that uh, has, who has the, some taxon names in, uh, in their Excel sheet or something like that. And the other end is something like uh, a regional uh, taxonomic checklist like uh, Europlasmed plant base, uh, which uh, is also in a way a, a local thing uh, as compared to the global aggregators. For the taxonomic aggregators, I've went a bit further in the classification effort. Of course, we want to classify everything. So uh, I actually formulated three categories here. One is the primary aggregator, which is uh, really something in the community. So it's either very respected by the community or it's done by the community and ideally both. So uh, it specializes on a certain group because the communities are usually uh, taxonomically defined in that way. And uh, it uses and provides a single classification. So the second category are the secondary aggregators that actually cover all taxa uh, that uh, uh, actually give also a single classification and ideally they would be aggregating actually a primary uh, aggregators. And uh, examples for that are Catalog of Life or uh, in Europe <clears throat> then uh, the PC EU Nomen. I'm referring to Europe because it's a European project, of course. So uh, in the Tetric context, we have also the third category, which is repositories. I just called them repositories. Before I had something like lookup aggregators, and I thought about several names there, but essentially it's repositories with a user interface. So uh, they are very useful because I, for example, in global names, I found names I didn't find anywhere else which I was looking for. Unfortunately, I didn't get more information from there neither, but at least they had registered those names uh, in their database. But uh, if a service is there where you can actually direct your query to a specific data set within the uh, repository, then you get a primary or a secondary uh, aggregator function there. So there's a big potential if we can kind of agree on infrastructures providing these services that we actually get all things in one place and we can actually develop the software for the services <clears throat> at one place only and together. Okay, so names are the way to link things. Uh, we have to realize everybody has been struggling a bit with taxon concepts, et cetera, et cetera and uh, taxon IDs or name usage IDs and all that. And I think it's all not really useful at this time uh, 
because what we have is names and we have to sort them out first. So uh, if you check a name with an aggregator, any of them, uh, you get some hints on data quality, uh, on, I should have the time here up west somewhere, uh, and um, uh, you can get information on nomenclatural correctness, uh, and also if there is a taxonomy in <clears throat> in the uh, aggregator, you get the taxonomic position, and if it's uh, a valid or accepted name, etc. And we already have these, so they are out there. You can do all this already in several places, uh, and so uh, actually, if you're doing it. Uh, you always end up in an interactive process because if you compare name strings, you always get this rest of things that don't match or don't match completely. And so uh, Matt, using the, the name string itself as the identifier of the name doesn't work. So we need actually, uh, we need identifiers for names unique identifiers for names, unique identifiers for everything that is really used as a name. In Worldflow Online, we have this defini definition of effectively published names. That's a, tax, a, a botanical concept. Uh, I wouldn't go so far that every mention of a name is uh, something that needs a unique identifier if it varies, but everything that's really used should have a... a an ID, and that's, for example, realized in Worldflow Online now. So if something is given back, it should have the aggregator ID in it, and so that you can go back later via the ID and not via the name string again to actually see what has happened on the aggregator side with that name. And then you could go one step further uh, a recommendation would be that local data sets of any size incorporate these IDs into their treatment so that they can actually go back later and see if some changes have occurred, for example, in the new version of Catalog of Life or World Floor Online, etc. So uh, the uh, this can be done manually. This can be incorporated into your website instead of these links that link with the canonical name. You always have, you often have that. Look at, uh, for example, at Tropicos, uh, the interface gives you a whole series of links, which are all name searches and not name links in the sense of referring to an ID. So uh, you can put that into your portal. And what would be really nice is to have on the aggregator side a service that's, uh, that I call a, a concept subscription so that you actually can store your list of your name IDs somewhere. And when there's a new version or even uh, an immediate change of the concept in the aggreg aggregator side, you get a notification. It doesn't tell you what's right. It just tells you something changed. And that would be very useful for anybody from working in conservation to taxonomists. Okay, and uh, one thing to avoid that we have an uh, inflation of IDs, I wanted to mention that as well, is that actually <clears throat> if you're having a data set that published, that you actually use the aggregator's IDs directly <clears throat> uh, as your ID. And there's an example in PACI where the reverse is done. Actually, the primary aggregator IDs are used as the PC name IDs and are provided to people who query the PC portal. And that is very advantageous because uh, you can go back and decide, okay, I don't want to query PC again. I want to query directly index Fungorum. Uh, and in the case of uh, Europlus Med, we are going to use the WFO ID, so we already have three possibilities to go on with our queries in the future. Okay, so uh, that's it. I'm, I could say something more just to spend my 46 seconds, but uh, <laughs> if there are any questions, uh, uh, floor is open.
Any questions to Walter? Yes. Um, give us a mic, please. Just a quick question. You mentioned uh, through the portal querying all these primary like name catalogs, say Index Fungorum or World Four yeah. Online. Uh, how do you handle, or what do you, how do you handle or uh, names, or what do you do in case you have a name or you want to store a name that is not in either of these catalogs? Where do you take the identifiers from? Well, actually, uh, this is the information flow we have to organize. I mean, and that, for example, in mycology, we gave the uh, example of index forgorum is working quite well, I think. Uh, it's updated uh, regularly from two sites, and uh, uh, every new name gets a new identifier. A problem in that specific case I should mention is that they do name corrections. Uh, so, uh, uh, orthographic variants are not necessarily pre uh, preserved with their own ID. So, these are things what I have on my last slide, which vanished, uh, which I wanted for the discussion. Can we have the last slide again? Not, not the, la the pen ultimate slide, in fact. Uh, it's what we want from the aggregators. We want a clear policy as to correction of names. So they should be transparent in saying, okay, we, an ID changes in the moment when I'm doing an orthographical correction or not. Better uh, if they would do a new ID, of course. Yeah, there we are. Yes, no, next, yes. And of course, there has to be a resolvable unique ID. Uh, and I've been discussing this with the uh, uh, catalog of life a lot in the past month, and I think, Rolaf, you're convinced that you need a name ID, I hope. <laughs> um, as far as I know, they already do have one, and it is stable, as according to Marcus During. Yes, the point is, it's actually called name usage ID, and it was intended to be exactly that, a name usage ID, which is not a name ID. But uh, with, with a lot of experimentation, all of you correct me, uh, they found out that the taxon or name usage ID in the real sense is a very complicated thing to handle. And so at the moment, as to I'm informed, the name usage ID in Catalog of Life is actually a name ID. We're going to hear something more about in a presentation given by Marcus, hopefully, or by Olaf, we don't know yet, <laughs> later. Oh, and I'm, I was dropping out of the picture. So One more uh, question. We, we still have time, yes. So when you have a, a name and then it gets moved into a different genus and so you have a bacteria and a name, um, wouldn't it be useful to have name IDs that are hierarchical so that you know effectively it's the same name, but a different name? Otherwise, you have two separate IDs for two names that are actually internally linked. If you want to resolve something, you are coming in with a string. And if that string was already used as a name, as a designation, we say in botany, uh, then uh, it should have a relationship in your aggregator to the correct name. So if it's, for example, a original spelling that has to be corrected, it should be a kind of synonym of the uh, homotypic thing that actually uh, is the same name. Did that answer your question? You're looking as if it didn't. <laughs> Hi, Walter. Henry. Um, I'm wondering, with all these orthographic variations, that they never disappear, they might still be searchable, but they resolve to maybe a single name. So that was my one hope. Um, and also maybe that, um, oh, yeah, I've forgotten my second point. But um, So yeah, if the, the orthographic va variations remain searchable in all these databases, that's important. Oh, yes. And if there are name changes at the aggregate site, it would be really appreciated if we know 
why it's changing and who changed it. Because at the moment, in a lot of these sites, you just see the names changed, but you have no reference as to why it has changed. And that's quite important to many taxonomists. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree. But I would be grateful just to get the notification that something changed as a first step. So that's implementing a service on big databases. So uh, I think we have to go step by step there. But normally something is noted when changes are made, uh, as le at least in, in Catalog of Life, and uh, that should be made public. Quentin, you wanted to continue? Yeah, I, I guess my point was that you actually have an, a naming event when you publish a paper with a name in it. And that name may then get tweaked. But you could have identifiers for the naming event, which links back to the protolog and all of the other the author and everyone else like that. And that's more solid than the different variations that come after that, which may include being a, a, a change of genus, or it might be an orthographic variation because it's uh, uh, was originally published wrong in the wrong gender or something like that. But you don't have any idea of having something like an identifier for an event. I have an idea, but I don't have time. <laughs> so uh, we could come back to that. But uh, yes, I, I know what you're referring to, but uh, I think we have to go move on. And uh, now we have Marcus talk and Olaf did you is Marcus online okay great so Marcus During is uh, checklist and GBIF backbone developer uh, for GBIF and catalog